From Reminder Media, this is Stay Paid, a sales and marketing podcast on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business. Hosted by the VP of Marketing, Josh Steik, and Reminder Media's president, Luke Akery. So get ready to hear the golden nuggets that will allow you to live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. Happy New Year, Luke. (laughs) Josh has been given a new sound effects box. And I've never seen Josh happier in the, how many episodes are we in? We're now like 100, 100 and, and something, something and like 110. Josh was like 100 and, yeah, I don't know either. But he has been given <laughs> this sound box now. And my first question, this is how terrible, now give you guys a window to get to know me a little bit more. It's how terrible I am. What was the first question I asked? Hey, is there a farting sound on that sound box? <laughs> nice. What's wrong with this, you, man? The, nice. Dude, the, the state paid uh, podcast is going off the deep end in 2020. Uh, That's what's going to happen. We got but sound effects. Sound effects. We are, you know, we're killing it. Obviously, you know, Josh, you're about to introduce our new guest. And super excited. Super excited. Off 2020 that yes. I could think of. When I heard that we were able to have this person on the podcast, it really actually made me feel proud at the same time nervous. Because when we're interviewing, yeah, when we're interviewing (laughs) guests that are a little bit higher echelon, no offense to our past guests, I'm not saying you weren't high up there, but you know, it's like, wow, this is awesome. We're actually getting somewhere. Well, our guest today, a lot of you are going to know, his name is Peter Lorimer. He is an entrepreneur, real estate expert, and co-host of the Netflix series, Stay Here, where he helps struggling property owners redesign and market their short-term rentals into money-making Showstoppers. <laughs> in 2010, Peter Dude, launched... That, that sound box on, is going to kill me. Launched PLG Estates, a Beverly Hills-based boutique real estate brokerage, and now has over 200 hand-picked agents working on his team. Pete, Ooh. welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Wow, what an intro. And, <laughs> and may I be the first to say, Happy New Year! <laughs> Woo! Oh, dude. He was looking for the sound. He was looking yeah. for the right sound. Yeah, he, was, he, was like, try, he was trying to click the right sound. Hey, man, super excited to have you on. I was sharing with you before we jumped on the podcast. The first time I t- came across you was on Inman News. Your videos are everywhere. You know, you do great stuff, and it seems like you've blown up. And so really just honored to have you on. Also honored that you are a client of ours at Reminder Media and have been for years. Yeah. So it's just an honor to have you as a client and what we're doing. You know, if you could just really introduce yourself to the audience, there's probably some people, though not many, there's probably some people, though, that haven't heard about you. And I would love for you to share your story of how did you get into real estate and what brought you, you know, to where you're at today. And then we'll dive into really how you've built your real estate business, because it really is impressive what you have now. But just share kind of who you are and your journey with the audience. Sure, sure. So, well, first of all, thank you very, very, very much for, uh, for having me on. It is an honor and a privilege. And um, I can't even believe that I'm alive in 2020, let alone on a <laughs> podcast. Uh, you know, I think I'm probably stepping on landmines and you guys have already got questions forming of why wouldn't you be alive in 20? Anyway, I guess we'll get there. Um, you know, um, how did my, my journey really, like most people, I think for the, the majority of people in real estate, it isn't an industry that we kind of were in high school and we're like, I'm going to be a realtor. <laughs> it is something that we tend to kind of get to. And I'm very pleased that I got to it. And I'm, I, I feel very fortunate that I got to it. But my journey started um, and still very much is rooted in the creative um, I was, uh, I came from, uh, I was born in a city called Leeds, which is near Manchester in the industrial cold north of England. Kind of like Pittsburgh, right? That's kind of like, uh, not that I've ever been to Pittsburgh, but I imagine Pittsburgh and Leeds yeah. are quite similar. <laughs> <laughs> Confirmed. And, um, and then I wanted to escape not just the city, but kind of everything. I grew up in a pretty crappy neighborhood. Mm. And I, back then... I dove headfirst into music and um, I was, of all things, a I was a classical trombonist, if you can believe it. Dude, that's sexy, and, man. That attracted right? all the women. I'm sure when <laughs> you pulled out that trombone. Well, you're a trombone. trumpet player, right? I started trumpet? on trumpet and I moved to guitar and piano because I realized there's not a lot of huh. girls that fall for the trumpet player. I hate to say it. I'm sounding like such a such an idiot right now, but there's not. But I don't know. Tell me about trombone. I mean... I, <laughs> 
No, trombone didn't get the chicks. It got the heavy drinkers. That's what it got. <laughs> Everybody who played the trombone. The ISO, I mean, we were like the, the you know, the, 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 the alcoholic part of the, uh, of the band, as it were. Uh, but, uh, um, and then, you know, playing in orchestras, I did really well. I was given a free scholarship by the, by the Royal College of Music as, at a really young age. And my, the biggest part of my life, other than real estate and my wife, is, is what came next. In, in Britain, uh, certainly in the 80s, you didn't need to show ID to get into nightclubs. <laughs> and so when I was touring with these musicians that were all older than me, um, in Britain, it's 18 and you're in the club, right? So I went, walked into a club, happened to be in my hometown. It was called The Warehouse in Leeds, where the DJ was from Chicago. And that is where I experienced Chicago house music. Ooch, 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 <laughs> ooch. Right? <laughs> so I was like, screw the trombone. You know, I want to go do that. I want to go make house records, right? I'm like, how do you make house records? So I thought, well, what I need to do is I'm in a provincial town where there really is no... Um, no music business. So at 15, dropped out of high school, trombone under one arm, bag under the other, kissed my mother goodbye, and I said, I'm off to London to become a record producer, mum. That's awesome. And she said, ah, you are a child, and we are not allowed to let you do it. And I'm like, I'll be fine. Don't worry. I'll see you later. And off I went. And I immediately walked into a recording studio and had a load of hits. No. <laughs> I uh, remember arriving in London with a lump in my throat and not much money in my wallet, being freaking terrified. But it's that... The, 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 in, in, in my story all the way through, there are these moments of fight or flight. Hmm. And there, there are lots of turning points that I've had where I, I can't get all the way to the end. I can only get 65% of the way there, logically, in my head, and the rest of it is a leap of faith. Mm. And so arriving in London, I'm like, well, I'm in the right city. This is where records are made. This is where all the labels are. Oh, what now? So then I start. I worked in every dead-end job you can imagine. I was a kitchen hand. I was a cleaner. I was a security guard. I was... Everything and anything you can... I worked in the women's lingerie department, a freaking department store, lied about my age. <laughs> and... Oh, <laughs> I get, you know what? Will you send me one of those? Yeah, <laughs> we're going to send you a sound box. Done That's deal. my fee. Sound with the fee. <laughs> so I'm going to stay paid by getting an effects box. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so... Within... Uh, I. Uh, uh, a lot of my story is just single-minded. I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. So I'm there working as a security guard, and I'm like, I'm going to be a record producer. <laughs> there was no joining of the dots. Right. But because I had this fire in my mind of it was going to happen, it was just a question of time. Uh, I enjoyed nightclubs a lot. They were a very big part of my story because that's where the house music lived. I frequented all the clubs in London, connected with the right folks, had a shitty job, but, you know, then was in the nightclubs in London, happened to be in a nightclub at the right moment, and the guy turned around and says, here, Peter, you, you know how to play piano, right? I'm like, yeah. And he said, oh, you know computers, right? And I'm like, yeah, kind of. I didn't really. <laughs> and he goes, great, you're in the band. And that band had a number one hit in the UK, and uh, my record producing career was off and running. Wow. That and is so awesome. um, I had approximately between the UK and the US about 50 number ones in the, in the dance charts. That is working amazing. Working with everybody. Man. Yeah, working for, with everybody all the way back to people like In Excess and David Bowie. And I retired from music around Christine Aguilera, that hmm. era. Hmm. Wow. And I worked with them all. You know, there's a, uh, I think it was Richard Branson that said, uh, when an opportunity presents itself, say, say yes, yes and figure, and it, out figure it out later. It's that same principle, man. It's just being in the right place, putting yourself out there. 
Life is about life. ready, fire, aim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag golden nugget. <laughs> so it was after that. After, so what led you from record producing to <clears throat> L.A.? I think real estate investing, right? It's kind of your first foray yeah. into real estate. I mean, let, okay, let's get into it. So um, I remember working. I worked with George Michael in the U.K. And his manager was a big L.A. dude, right? A very famous manager by the name of Michael Lippman, who was a lovely guy. And he was like, I took it for granted. I took it for, for what he was saying to be legit. And he goes, hey, kid, I like you. If you're ever in L.A., I'll manage you. <laughs> so I remembered that. Yeah. And then I got on a plane, knocked on his door. And I'm like, uh, remember that conversation we had, Michael, about you would manage me if I was in L.A.? Well, I'm here. In fact, I just moved here. And I hadn't. I was on a, work, I was on a tourist visa. Hmm. And, and so I said, so uh, let's get to it, yeah? And I remember the look on his face. He was like, oh, no. Wow. <laughs> I didn't really mean that, kid. But anyway, because I was friends with George, he, he hooked me up with a manager here. And then I met a partner. I had another you know, 20, 25 number ones in the U.S. after the U.K. And, um, and then, wow. then uh, I tend to do this a lot, and I don't, not a lot, but I do it at, at, at moments. So around the turn of the century, wow, that made me just feel 100 years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, I've always been very techy because the music that I loved was computer based, right? right? So I was very like, you know, I was in chat rooms and online before AOL. And I remember being in this chat room where I was talking to some kid in Korea or something about nerdy stuff with music. And he said, Hey, do you know you can rip now? This is about 1999. Yeah. And I'm like, what's, what's ripping? And he said, Oh, you can take DVD, uh, CDs. And you can pull the, pull the music off, zeros and ones. This is pre-Napster. Yep. And I'm like, when I heard those words, instantly I knew the music business was going to be over. Yeah. Or uh, it was going to be forever changed. Change. Wow. Irreversibly. Yeah. Now, depends who I'm chatting to, but you guys are staring at me with, with, uh, with like to say, Pete, tell the absolute truth and nothing but the truth. That's usually what we do, you know. That's, you know, Josh. (laughs) So there was something else that occurred in my life, which is, uh, you know, I can tell you being in the music business, people think it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Well, I am here to confirm it's absolutely that. (laughs) And And the trombone (laughs) takes you there. (laughs) Right. Can you imagine? I nearly played the flute. It might be a completely different story if I played the flute. So, uh, I was a wild man. I was a wild dude. And it was electronic music. It was EDM. It was ecstasy. It was all sorts of shenanigans that were awesome. But then I reached a point in my life where I'm like, okay, I can't continue doing this. I'm either going to die or, you know, for a dude to be 40 years old in nightclubs behind, you know, DJing, it's... It's kind of time to grow up. Mm. And my, not that there's anything wrong with DJing in nightclubs at 40 for you listeners out there that might be doing that. We have a, we have a pretty large demographic. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? There's probably some. For that, for that. <laughs> there will be some. I had to get out, right? I had to get out. And I was dating this psychotic, toxic demon from the UK. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> she was awful. I mean, she was awful. But she was a chick who had a uh, successful antiques business in the U- in in LA, and she folded that business and became a real estate agent. And she was toxic. And in her first year, she did pretty well. So then all of the marbles started kind of rolling into place, and I'm like, okay. Just had a really good run in the music business. My last year, I had a a, a bunch of number ones, and and I finished with a number one in 12 countries that I wrote. And and I'm like, what do I do with this? I can party my ass off, which will be great, but I've done that for a long time. Mm. 
Um, I can go buy a stupid car or I can start investing this in something. And then my brother, uh, who is also from Leeds, obviously, moved to Australia 30 years ago. His house was quadruple what houses were in L.A. Hmm. My mum's house was double what houses were in L.A. And at the time, New York was double what houses were in L.A. And I'm like, hmm, this Internet thing, that probably means that people are going to move to cities that they really want to be in so they can work. So I started loading up on property because I felt that Los Angeles was undervalued. And people said to me, how did you go take the leap? Well, it wasn't so much a leap. I knew that if I had a bunch of Benjamins in my back pocket for too long, I was going to blow them. Mm. So I started looking at areas around Los Angeles that I knew or thought were good. There was an area, there still is an area called North Hollywood, which is where a lot of the recording studios are. So I knew it, but it's kind of the arse end of the valley, <laughs> which is... Um, the Valley is L.A.'s New Jersey, <laughs> right? And, and I'm like, but it's only like 15 minutes to Sunset Strip, you know, to like the Rainbow, the Rainbow Bar, Sunset Strip's 15 minutes. So I'm like, okay, this is kind of a no-brainer that people are going to start moving here because West Hollywood, which is the cool stuff, is all too expensive. So I started buying up places. My gamble paid off. I made a ton of money on it. And then downtown LA, which was always dormant my enti entire time here. I moved here in 93. I saw the, the shoots of development going on there. And there was one, maybe two loft buildings. So I took all the money. I'm a big all or nothing guy. I took all the marbles. And my lovely wife, who I just met, I'm like, I'm taking all the money. I'm putting it in lofts, everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then... A weird phenomenon happened, which uh, is the people in my former life began to see that something had changed. And there is a phenomenon which was really unexpected for me, which was people that I worked with in the music business that knew, like, and trusted me there. Many of them were prepared to work with me in the real estate business because they still knew, liked, and trusted me. Mm. Right. And so I had creatives coming out of the woodwork going, we don't really trust real estate agents. They're all slimy, but we know you and you seem to be doing okay. Can you advise us? So I started advising and then I'm like, shit, I might as well get my license. So I got my license and I remember being in my Keller Williams office. Tell me when to stop, fellas, by the way. No, man, you're, this is amazing. Keep going, yeah? Yeah. All right. Um, I was standing in my Keller Williams office in 2007, and I overheard uh, a really great agent by the name of, I, 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 maybe I shouldn't give his name, but he said to his friend, I just sold my hairdresser his third investment property. And I'm like, oh, I, th I thought maybe he's a big time Beverly Hills, you know, like uh, trying to think, one of those famous guys, right? And he said, no, it's a local guy up the block here. Hmm. And, and it, at this point, it began to not compute. And so I spoke to my manager and I said, if everybody's getting 100% mortgages, what's going to stop them walking away if there's any kind of like, if, we, if there's another Iraq? Mm -hmm. And she looked at me with terror and she said, well, this, that doesn't happen. This is America. We keep going up. You're not in Britain now. And I'm, as soon as I heard those words, you're not in Kansas now, Dorothy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was like, okay, something <clears throat> is wrong. And I couldn't put my finger on it, but I knew something was wrong. Cause wow. There were 105% mortgages. <sighs> Who's not going to get those? Mm. So I spoke to my, my wife and I, and I said, we need to dump everything. So we dumped a lot of property. We didn't dump it all. We lost a couple of things in the, in the crash, but we got out of a whole gang load of it. That's amazing, man, that you saw that. That's amazing. Um, and then I said to Cindy, who is a massive part of the story, when 2008 and nine, we had a brand new baby in 2000, practically the day the crash happened is when my daughter was born. Hmm. Um, 
And the whole internet thing and the whole being able to communicate in a non-traditional way just was, I, I was on fire with it. I couldn't get enough of it. It consumed my every thought. And then Twitter came out and then the MySpace and, and then Facebook came out and I'm like, it was the holy grail to me. It was, there was nothing more clear than this was going to be the way to do business. And so once again, I said to Cindy, okay, take all the marbles, take them all. <sighs> we pushed it all into Google. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> and then we then, I saw a schematic from the same chat room that told me about ripping. Yeah. I saw a drawing of an iPhone. And I was on a BlackBerry. <laughs> and they sent me a hand-drawn picture of, of, a, of a BlackBerry, of, of an iPhone. And I called Cindy. I said, take 50% of everything and buy Apple. So we took 50% and then we bought Apple. Dude, you're and a then freak. That is amazing. I'm not. It was a moment. Yeah. It, yeah, but I'm right. not Gary. Yeah. I didn't make as much as Gary. <laughs> yeah. um, and then... And then I loaded up on Netflix as well before Netflix, you know, the day it came out, I was like, yep, that's the future. And I got into that. And then by that time, the market was beginning to bubble again. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I invested in lots of properties. And, you know, that's that's really the tale of, of me. Now, why did I leave Keller Williams is always a question that's asked. Yeah. Because... In 2000, I joined Keller Williams in 2005 and in two, as a new agent. And in 2010, I was the number one Keller Williams agent in, in uh, L.A. County out of all the offices. Wow. And I had this burning desire because I was a record producer. I like being in the back room pulling the levers, right? That's kind of who I am. I really enjoy it. I like building things. And I remember... Because I'm not driven by, I'm not really driven by money at all. And I remember speaking to Cindy, I'm like, Keller Williams have made us a great offer. You know, we can have the corner office. We can have an incredibly low split. They're going to give us staff and blah, 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 blah. But I want out. I said, I want to start my own firm. Hmm. And so we took, we took a leap of faith. <clears throat> out, it was an old nail salon, actually, in Beverly Hills. It was not much bigger. Than, in fact, it was probably about the size of this room. Hmm. And we put our names on the lease and we opened up PLG, not knowing if it would flounder or fly. And uh, we were very clear with our focus, which was uh, digital marketing only. And we aimed at creatives and we were niching down before the phrase hashtag niching down even came out. Mm. You were digital marketing um, only in 2010. That's... Correct. That was very. That was. I mean, Google Ads was far was before the, out. Yeah. Facebook Ads wasn't really running yet. I mean, Facebook yeah. was only available to the public for a couple of years at this point. So that's yeah. that's incredible. What what I mean, other than just the foresight, what was what else was leading you towards that? Was there were you thinking about video at that point? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I was thinking about formats that other people wouldn't do. Right. So I knew that. I didn't really believe in the LA Times and I'd never had anybody walk into one of my open houses with a newspaper. Mm. <laughs> they all walked in with their phone. Right. right? When Zillow was new, I can't remember how, Zillow, how old Zillow is now. But I've never had anybody walk in with a newspaper or a postcard saying, oh, I got this in the mail. I just thought I'd come and buy it. No, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't happen. <laughs> and so uh, when we left Keller Williams, I knew I couldn't outspend them in marketing. I yep. couldn't outspend Coldwell Banker or Prudential at the time, but I could run circles around them with media campaigns. Hmm. Because no, everybody was still in that editorial, let's please everyone all the time mindset, where I was like, screw that, let's just go after the creatives. We'll call it the velvet rope philosophy of if you're in a nightclub, thank good old nightclubs, they, they, they come back into my life. Full circle. It's like you're in a nightclub, there's a VIP room, and everybody wants to be in it, even though it's exactly the same as everywhere. The other room, people yeah. are just clamoring. It's called VIP. Right. It's just called VIP, but it's actually, a lot of them are crap. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm like, let's have that, that philosophy. And this is where I got it from Richard Branson, which is luxury for all. Mm. Right? He did that with, with Virgin Airways. Yep. Yeah. Airlines. 
And I'm like, let's do that for real estate. Luxury for all. We treat everyone like they're a luxury client, even if they're buying a $300,000 condo. Mm. And we didn't go after the, and I've got nothing against these people, we didn't go after the dentists, the accountants, the doctors, you know, the lawyers. We went after the musicians and the actors and the screenwriters and the this and the that. And we, we got known as, uh, as that kind of firm. So when you represent a bunch of cool people, the VIP room philosophy, other people come. Right. Now, this was all so gut. Smart. This was all gut. Yeah. It was all gut. And now we're at four offices, 200 agents. Still same philosophy, still going after the, the velvet rope type philosophy? Still going after creating a branding that is unafraid mm. to own who we are. Mm. I love that, man. And I'm I seeing that. I'm seeing that more in real estate now. But we were, al I, we were alone for so many years to the point I'm like, shit, am I, am I, am I in the, heading in the wrong direction here? Because there's, yeah. there's no other ships. Yep. Well, you know what's interesting is we have done this podcast and worked with tons of clients. What we are finding is obviously authenticity is the key to attract people in the digital age, especially because everybody's trying to be the next Gary Vee right now. Everybody's trying to build a brand, right? So if you weren't on the forefront like you are, if you're listening to this and just getting started, you know, one of the keys is that authenticity. And what we find is that, hey, it's about attracting your tribe, where it really yep. circles back to me, and I'd be curious to get your opinion is, it all circles back to just, it's about relationships. And when you are unashamed in your marketing to talk about what you believe in, to attract the people you believe in, call it the niche, whatever it is, it really is that all you're doing is coming back to the fundamental of you're having a real conversation, a real relationship with people who know, like, and trust you, as you said earlier on this podcast. Like, so it really comes back to just like, you're just building a sphere or a tribe of people that buy yeah. into what you believe and they become advocates and they get more people like that. And that's flywheel. Like, is that what you see when you look at where your deals come percent. from? Thousand percent. So I have always been against Zillow, right? I've got nothing personal against them. God love them. Take over the world. I don't care. <laughs> but as far as why am I going to, because it's ours, right? It's, it's, I don't want to get into IRR and our businessy terms, but I look at the most valuable commodity I have is time. Mm -hmm. I love my wife and kids, and the more time I can spend with them whilst earning money uh, efficiently is what I want to do. So, and I've had my agents at PLG do this. I've said, map out, seeing as we're, at, we're in a new year, I, it would be a good time to start. Look at all the deals that you got in 2019 out there, whoever's listening. Do a roadmap of where they all came from. Yeah. And do a roadmap of approximately how many hours you spent on each deal. Obviously, we spend a lot more time with buyers than we do with sellers. <clears throat> so just do averages. When you do that, I think you will be amazed that the vast majority of your deals, unless you're someone that's spending... 10,000 or more on Zillow and has a team to dig through all the piles of crap. If you're just a regular agent, I think you will be amazed that I would estimate at least 80%, if not 90% of your business actually comes from your sphere. Mm. Yet, as an industry, we are obsessed chasing the new leads, yeah. with chasing yeah. people who we have no emotional <laughs> leverage over. That's a golden nugget. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I, they, people, they don't care. Thank you very much for the sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> so my entire theory hinges on this. I would much rather try and work with someone I know, sort of know, might know, could know. Because let's take my friend Bob over here. Bob introduces me to his buddy John, right? Um, John, he says, Pete, you should meet John. John's thinking about buying a house in L.A. next year. I speak to John. Hey, John, love to help you. Da, 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 da. Now, John knows I know Bob. And we're both friends with Bob. So John kind of is screwed because he now can't shaft me because hmm. he'll look like a dick to John. <laughs> now, <laughs> Dude, that is so good. <clears throat> you boil it down. That's it. That's the entire essence of 
everything to do with sphere. Mm-hmm. Now, if you can cr- approach your sphere, because you've got your A's, your B's, your C's, and your D's, right? Your A's are your mates, right? They're, they're probably most likely always going to work with you. Your right. B's, you've got to nudge them, but they'll, they'll probably work with you. Your C's are the ones that are on the fence. So going in and going, hey, I know that you know Bob, I'm a real estate agent. You didn't get the introduction, right? You just know that they're you're in their sphere, so you're trying to reach out to them via email or social media. Hey, I know that you know Bob. I know Bob too. We go bowling together. Hey, 2020 is a great year to buy or sell. Have you considered buying or selling? Because rates are really no. Unsubscribe. Gone. Right. right. I do not want to hear from you. Whereas if somebody, and people have done this with me, they reach out and they go, hey, Pete. I was just going through uh, people that we have in common, and I see that you know Bob. I know Bob because I used to play in a band with him. Oh, you know what? I used to play in a band with him as well. Bob's cool. Bob's awesome. Anyway, I just wanted to reach out and introduce myself. Um, and then I would, I would have a few more pings backwards and forwards. And then I would say, look, this wasn't the reason for me reaching out when it was. <laughs> I would say, look, I didn't, this isn't the reason why I'm reaching out. But down the road, I, you know, I represented Bob and his transactions. You don't know me, but I'd really love the opportunity to try and earn your business. That's the key phrase. Mm. I'd love the opportunity to try and earn your business as that. opposed to, can I show you a house? <laughs> Always give them an out. Yes. Always. Yes. I love that. And then go in for the kill. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget that part. <laughs> going for Don't the kill. forget to go. Nah, I mean, the that, that is so much it. It's unbelievable. It just is mind boggling to me. It's like you say, we see this all the time. We've actually done a webinar on it uh, recently of just like we see the data from the National Association of Realtors clearly say, states when you look at all the transactions, they come from your sphere. It's like freaking 64% of all listings that happen in the United States. 86. 86. I mean, good grief, it comes from your ship. But when you look at where agents spend their time, energy, and money, it's totally away Strangers. from their sphere. It's really, yeah. but I think it comes down to this in my mind. I think it's because we're an instant gratification people, and we're really in, in an industry where the average agent's making $42,000 a year. They're desperate for that deal. They're desperate for you know their next listing, and so they they are chasing that lead because they they think I got to get a sale today instead of realizing hey if you just just pause for a second and you spend that energy time and effort just building the relationships you have nine times out of ten you're going to get to that deal and that transaction so much faster and it's just crazy to me as I look at the industry. I, I agree. So let's get deep. Let's get deep. All right. All right. So. The two words, the two words. Can you hear that? <laughs> I didn't know you were going deep with your voice. I thought you meant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> deep with philosophy. I nearly, nearly cracked a rude joke there, but you said keep it PG. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the two words that I bang on about all the time, not just in real estate, but in every aspect of my life. One of them is a word that we use all the time, almost kind of like frivolously. And that word is fear. Now, fear comes in a thousand different disguises. When you boil it all down, the number one foe of success is ego. Now, I don't mean in the, I'm the man. That's one side of ego. Ego is fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of what other people think of you, fear of not being enough. Fear of coming last, fear of being too fat, too thin, too old, too young, too tall, too short. Mm. And when we don't address the issues that scare us, it's easy to just go into, well, I'm busy because I'm getting the phones ringing. I'm getting these leads. I'm in the act act of being a real estate agent, but I'm not being proactive Mm. i'm being reactive proactive is picking up the 50 pound phone in year one calling everyone in your database and saying hey bob (laughs) how you doing mate how's the wife how's the leg how's the dog whatever it is 
Just wanted to let you know I've had a change of careers. I'm only putting you on point just to give you information, not trying to stalk you, but love to earn your business. I'm now working in the real estate industry. Love mm. to help you and your family as I have done before. So anyway, good, God bless, mate. See you at Thanksgiving. Later. That's what I did over and over and over and over again. And a lot of people didn't want to work with me. Right. But when you are polite and of service and you put them first and the money last. Mm, that's a goal. And you are, you are, you are, you become bullet. Now, don't get me wrong. I have paper thin self-esteem. <laughs> I wake up in the morning with, I have imposter syndrome like an MF, like you hmm. would not believe, which is, and I never shared this with you, I got out of the music business because I was a maniac. I also got sober. Hmm. And that is why I got so, I, part of the reason why I drank and did drugs is because of imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is this. You wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror and you're like, well, I'll never be as good as this guy. They're all going to figure out that I'm kind of half ass in this and I'm going to get a tap on the shoulder and they're going to ask me to leave. Mm. I wake up with that every single day. The difference is I just don't listen to it anymore. Mm. I used to. I don't anymore. But I did for a long time. And it lies and it's horrible. But it's your own mind. So how do you... You know, when you rely on instinct, which one do you trust? Right. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. so good. Yeah. No, I mean, thanks for sharing that. But the, like, how do you mm. then, because I know you're, you, you have so many videos. I know like about four years ago or something, you really started getting into producing videos. So you're talking about the relationship and how everything's driven from that. So where does the, where does like the video and the media piece come into it? And does every... Does every agent need to do that in order to be successful today? Do they need to be on social media? Do they need to be producing videos? What are your thoughts on that? So my evolution was I did it as a real estate agent, and that's really social media is why I was the number one guy. It isn't because I'm better than anyone else or cleverer. It was because I was relentless with social media. My social media evolved because I opened my own firm. So my social media become, ge became geared more towards the real estate industry than, than buyers and sellers. Mm. But I'm going to give you my opinion. If I, was, if I was a brand new agent starting right now today, what would I do? Well, I wouldn't send postcards <laughs> and I wouldn't door knock and I wouldn't cold call. I would rather drive a bus. Mm. Mm. So... If your brokerage is, and don't, you don't need to listen, you don't need to listen to me, listeners. I'm just some strange bloke with big glasses and an even stranger accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's back to those hours spent, right? Door knocking to me is baffling. Baffling. Yeah. It's like I am going to wander the streets in the <clears throat> hope to find someone in that may want to sell their house when I knock on their door. How many hours is that? Is that going to take? I once calculated it probably takes 2,000 hours to get one sale, door mm. knocking. If I spend 20 hours sending DMs through social media, I will get a deal. So I don't know what the, the equation is there. What's 1,000% more yeah. effective? <laughs> so if you're a new agent, you must, 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 must. You have to have a Facebook business page because it is the gorilla in the corner of the room that drives everything. Mm -hmm. Forget your personal page, migrate everybody over to your business page, but make it look like a personal page. As a real estate agent, you have to be a, a blend of why are people going to know, like, if they don't know you, why are they going to trust you and why are they going to like you? Mm -hmm. They're only going to know and like you and eventually trust you by learning about your belief structures. I'm into house music. Ooch, ooch, ooch. So all my mates that bought, that used to go clubbing all bought their houses from me. Mm. Not all of them, but a lot of them. If I'm into horses or American football or swimming or skiing or, the, or whatever whatever it is make it known about 
what your belief structures are. I would even go as far as to say, if you want to talk about what you are politically, go ahead. Right. All of this, and I think it's finally beginning to fade away. The real estate industry has had a veneer where we all got to like smile and wear a name tag and have a beautiful day (laughs) after every sentence. (laughs) You know, make it a great day. That's it. Make it a great day. God, make me, just shoot me now. <laughs> and and I went the opposite way. And I talked to my clients like my mates. So if I was a brand new agent, and let's just say I, I live in an area called Studio City in, in Los Angeles, which is at the foot of the Hollywood Hills. If I was a brand new agent, and I didn't really know that many people, I would be out with a camera and I would be filming all the businesses in Studio City and I would be posting that online saying, here's my favorite new coffee shop. It's awesome because they've got this great new Nigerian coffee that you can only get here. Right, Bob? Seems to be a lot of Bobs today. (laughs) Right, Bob, tell us about your your coffee. (laughs) Well, my coffee, great. I'll be back next week with another tip on Studio City Secrets or whatever the hell. And then I would take that piece of content and I would pay for it to be advertised yeah. to 91604 and surrounding areas. That's so good. And I would give, 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 give. Gary's got a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook, as we all know. Yep. Mine's Sniff, 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 Bite. <laughs> Dude, you got to check out the YouTube yeah. video to see the look he gave <laughs> yeah, after that seriously. book title. That was a little look over the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> So sniff, 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 bite is a little bit more softly, softly, right? You sniff around folks, you give them stuff, you share. It's the same theory. You share, give, 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 yep. give, 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 then ask. Yep. For the right to earn, not to get, to earn. I love that. That's incredible. And then if I was an agent, I would sit every freaking open house I could get my hands on. And if there aren't open houses on a Sunday, you can sit them on a Saturday. And if there aren't open houses on a Saturday, I would sit them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I would do twilights every night of the week. I'd have my signs. I'd have 20 of them all over the neighborhood. And I would just get anyone and everyone that walks in. And if somebody wanted to go see a tool shed, a tool shed in Santa Barbara for $25,000, which is about an hour and a half drive from here, I'd be like, get in the car. And I'd drive them up. I'd buy him a latte, I'd buy him lunch, I'd buy him another latte, and then at the end of it, I'd drop him off and I'd say, I had a great day with you today. I hope you had a good day. Do you think we saw things that were good? <laughs> yeah, some things were okay. Well, listen, I and then, here it comes, then I would do the lean. Well, I hope I've earned your business. Lean, 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 lean. <laughs> hand out, hand out, hand out, and I would stay, and I'd look deep into their eyes. And I would not go back. And sometimes it was weird. And I would just leave my hand out in front like this. And then they shook it. And I'm like, glad to be working with you. Oh, man, that is so good. (laughs) That is so good. That was worth the whole podcast right there. (laughs) And and what did it cost me? It cost me two lattes and a freaking $5 foot long. That's it. Yep. No, man, that is so good. And talk like the, the, the hashtag in there is you, you talk to your clients like your mates. I mean, that is so good. You want to know marketing 101? That's it, man. Yeah. That is it. Hey, man, we want to honor your time. I could talk to you all day. I know you have a oh, hard shit. stop Do coming up here. Like, you are just unbelievable. No, it's okay. Let's go for a bit more. We can go for a bit more. Yeah, a bit more. We're okay, going. so I, I can give you another 10 minutes. Okay, sweet. So I have a question for you because I'm a junkie for self-development, okay? And you are just the guy. Your story is just unbelievable, man. It's just the faith you took at these different – the the foresight you had. And I'm wondering, like, I'm always like addicted to the top three things you need to do in your morning routine to be a millionaire, the top seven things you need to do to have a successful life. All that stuff, just that clickbait stuff grabs me. I know there's no magic formula out there, but I love asking the guests, what are the routines? What are the principles that you've applied in your life? Or as you look back, you go, these are the routines that have really driven success for me in my life. Mine's more of a mindset than it is a routine. So we're all, uh, well, similar age. I'm a bit old, I suppose. We're, we're kind of a similar age, right? Can we just pretend? Can yeah, we, we pretend can pretend. For absolutely. <laughs> Let's go deep. <laughs> hey, let's go deep. So 
We all played Donkey Kong, right? Yeah. Yes, I played Donkey Kong, yeah. We all played Donkey Kong, and I remember standing at the bottom of those ladders, looking up as the barrels clattered over my head, and looking up, well, not literally, because it was a game, but I remember thinking, there is no way, no way I am ever going to get to level two. No Mm. way. No way. And so then you learn every little move, every little thing. You explore every little routine, every little kind of move until before you know it, you're on level two, five, 10, 20. In the real estate, not just real estate, in business, whenever I have had an idea that I get that feeling, and we all have this feeling, wow, that's a great idea. I should, I should jump on that. Then what happens is we tend to kind of get other people's opinions and it gets diluted and it gets smashed. What I have made a career of is being so beat down thinking it will never work, yet I keep trying. For example, learning how to edit. I edit in all my own videos. And I still edit a lot of them now, especially my family ones. And I remember staring at that computer with freaking Final Cut open thinking, oh my God, like Donkey Kong. I'm never going to learn this. Why am I bothering? I'm spending hundreds of hours trying to figure this out. Why are you doing it, Pete? You're such a loser. Nobody wants to look at your stuff. You need to be prospecting. And you do need to prospect. (laughs) But I knew in my gut that if I armed myself with the skill set of being able to tell stories, even little silly ones through social media, I'm going to appeal to that side of people that are going to like me and trust me and want to know me if they don't. And I kind of bet everything on it. So my mindset is if it doesn't hurt or if it doesn't seem impossible, then it's too easy. Mm. That's so good, man. You're not, you're Learn not everything. Anything. You're not doing anything great unless it's hard. It's like I tell my brother that all the time because we, you know, he's building, I call it a real estate empire, right? So That's his it, real man. estate empire, he's, he's building a real estate empire. <laughs> and, you know, the ups and downs of real estate is just insane. And everybody knows that. It's really any business. I mean, the ups and downs of entrepreneurship and building a business is insane. Yeah. And I tell him all the time, dude, if it was easy, everybody would do it. It's in these moments. It's like I used to think I couldn't write a book. The longer and longer in my journey here in running Reminder Media, I go, wow, I actually, I have a bunch of stuff I could share now because <laughs> it's in those valleys. Yeah. Like if it wasn't hard, you know, everybody would do it. So that's so true. So what would you go back and tell younger Peter? What advice would you give your younger self? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. What would you tell that kid? Don't go with the trombone, go with the flute? No. <laughs> Oh, I made some big mistakes back in the day. In the music, I'll tell you one. I was sitting, now I didn't know, I was a kid, right? I was 19, I was like, I had a bunch of like, you know, club hits. I was never egotistical, but I was like, it's got to be, you can't sell out, man. It's got to be real. You've got to keep it real. These records are for the streets. And George, God bless him, George Michael, God rest his soul, um, he was mates with, with me, and the reason I knew him so well is my first manager was George's cousin. So <clears throat> yeah. I get called into CBS Records on the corner of Soho Square. George Michael's sitting there. Andros, my manager, sitting there. The chairman of CBS is sitting there. George wants to put out underground records on my label under a pseudonym. Now, the records, he was a master of pop, but he weren't that good at underground. I'm sitting in CBS going, George, you're my mate. I love you. But these records are not the material for my label. And I would tell younger Peter, it's not about you, Peter. This is about George, and he wants to put records out on your label. Put the records out on your label, you knucklehead. (laughs) I'm the guy that turned George Michael down. George Michael down. (laughs) I turned him down. And this this was in between faith and freedom. Oh. He's the biggest guy in the world. And then, yeah, I turned That's down. so funny. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for being here, Peter. Oh, Thanks for so sharing good. your story and sharing yeah. everything you've been up to. So as we mentioned, you can find, uh, you can check out Pete's show, Stay Here on Netflix. How else can people follow or connect with you? 
So Facebook, Pete Lorimer, Peter Lorimer Official, Instagram, Peter Lorimer, um, YouTube, just put my name in, you'll find me. And I do want to end it with this. Um, yes. I have been using American Lifestyle, which, by the way, listeners, this is a total coincidence. I think they had me on the show before they even realized that because <laughs> prior to the, us going live, they went, oh, I think Pete's been using American Lifestyle for years. Yes. I have, and it's the one Going on record here, and I'm not getting paid nothing. Am I? Am I getting paid? <laughs> We're going to send you a sound effects after this. <laughs> there you go. I've got a sound effects box. <laughs> it is the one piece of print I highly recommend. Why? Because, number one, it is beautiful. And number two, I send it to all my past clients. And I have people calling me up occasionally going, dude, that was such a great article. And I'm like, uh, sure, great. And <laughs> I'm clueless as to where it came issue. from. <laughs> That's so good, man. This so all... I would recommend that. Dude, thank you so much. Dude, you're making me blush, man. Yeah, that, is, that is too kind of you. That is amazing. We appreciate that. So yeah. thank you all for listening. To dive deeper into this episode, to get all the um, links and uh, all the links that Peter mentioned and everything, go to staypaidpodcast.com for the show notes. While you're there, you can also find the videos for all of our episodes. And if you're interested in supporting this show, two ways we ask you to do that. First is to rate us five stars on iTunes and leave a comment. And the second best way, Pete said it here multiple times, tell a friend. Tell a friend, Referrals baby. are the lifeblood of and, any and we'll business. And take, we'll take any reviews. They don't have to be five stars. I mean... If you hate Josh, but you love me, no, and you want to leave a three star, no. shoot over a, a text <laughs> message that's with a little bit of club music. Yes, a little bit of club. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> perfect to listen to in the background of State Pay Podcast. I love it. <laughs> nice relaxing. If you'd like to get a hold of me or Luke, you can email us at podcast at remindermedia.com or find us on Instagram. We're at Stay Paid Podcast. For this episode of Stay Paid, I'm Joshua Steich. Guys, and I'm Luke Acre, and please, yeah, reach out to us. I mean, I'm having a lot more listeners reach out, and I'm trying to answer everybody's questions, and I really want to make sure we take, you know, our passion here I was sharing with Peter before we started the podcast. Our passion for this is trying to take principles that you know we know in marketing are true things like the know like and trust and give you tangible actionable things that you can then implement in your business and it's just been over the years of leading reminder media and working with different business owners it's been amazing that the number one failure we see is and peter talks about this on the on this podcast it's just they they just don't take action and go back and listen to his story. And he was all in. He put all his marbles and he took action. He, he had faith, stepped out and took action. So many of us will listen to a podcast like this, go, hmm, that's a good idea. And you'll do nothing. And you'll wonder why your business isn't thriving. You'll wonder why you're not living the life of freedom that you want to live. And, and look at the bed. You made the bed. And here's my action item for you on this podcast. I think it's super tangible. Pull out your social media right now and DM 20 of your closest friends. DM them. It's so simple. DM them. Tell them you're thinking about them. Don't go in for the kill right away. Do the sniff, 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 and then bite them. Meaning go in, message them on social media, check in with them. Make sure you talk about, use the Ford method. Talk about their family, their occupation, their recreation, their dreams. Then come around after you build that relationship and at, lean in like Peter showed us on the video and just say, it was a pleasure you know, talking to you. Have I earned your business? Shake out, put out your hand there and earn their business. Remember, the difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer in every single industry. Josh told me just recently, it's up to 160 industries that we've had the privilege of working in. Every single industry we work in, the difference between top producers and mediocre producers, is top producers take action. So take action on that today. Woo!